All righty, folks, this man probably doesn't need an introduction. He is all over the place doing amazing things. I think one of the best things about this guest is he is willing to look himself in the mirror and be honest with himself and you. And I say this because he just put out a v, uh, an a interview or a breakdown of how he lost a couple of million bucks. That wasn't fun. <laughs> that wasn't easy. And most people wouldn't have the balls to do it. We've got Ryan Pineda with us today. How you doing, buddy? What's up, man? Always good to see you. I appreciate that. What what the heck, man? You're breaking social media. You're only supposed to post the wins, not know, your dude. losses. What are you doing? I don't know, man. You know, what's funny is um, that video was actually at WealthCon and it was a presentation I did. And I was like, man, what do, you know, these thousand people need to hear? And I was like, I think they need to hear that, you know, people struggle, you know, it's not just all, um, you know, good. And so, you know, the bigger thing is once you even get to a higher level, the struggle and the losses become bigger and bigger. Like it just, yeah. that's, that's the game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I just want to, I want to applaud you. I want to pat you on the back, whatever, whatever it is that, that kind of maturity self-reflection was not only, I'm sure appreciated by the audience, because if you are in the real estate investing game for the last five years, you had four really, really good years up and to the right. Couldn't do any wrong. Everything you touched turned to gold. And then last year, certainly the first half was rough. I knew lots of flippers who lost six figures. Some lost seven figures. And most of them don't have the balls to acknowledge it publicly. Um, they don't want to kind of take away the shine. They think it'll be a reputation hit and it won't. I think you, at least in my my view, and I'm sure others who follow for you a long time, have more respect for you now than even before, right? Because again, four years was easy. If you doubled or tripled down, it was easy. Um, that first six months in, in 2023, not easy. Lots of losses. The market stopped. And um, in that presentation, you really highlighted some lessons. So I think we should talk about them if you remember them. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And and let me add too, you know, it was also the second half of 2022. So <clears throat> I think for real estate investors, it's really been about the last 18 months that have been very difficult. Um, fix and flippers, especially because I mean, a guy like me going into, you know, this kind of fluke situation where they doubled rates faster than they ever have in history. Yeah. Um, you're going to get hit harder than everyone. And you know, I had like 50 flips going on. And so you, you have just bigger numbers you're playing with than everyone else. Um, you're just going to lose more when when something like that happens. But, you know, also on top of that, uh, even right now, like you're a rental guy. Um, it's hard to find rentals that pencil out. You know, if your whole game has been about just getting rentals. Well, guess what? In a high interest rate environment and a high price environment, it, it it's tough because rents have not caught up. Mm -hmm. So, what yeah, you know, it, it's tough to be a real estate investor right now, but the good news is, um, you know, I think we're finally out of it. Yeah, I think 2024 is setting up to be a lot different. And again, uh, I'll, I'll find the video. I'll link it below because I think really people need to watch that presentation. I remember one of the talks, one of the points that really hit home for me. And it's really because I know you and your story, right? One, one of the things that makes Ryan Pineda is you have historically time blocked your your when you work. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, you know, it's family time. It's it's all of that. You don't generally work weekends. You know, getting you after five o'clock is very rare. All of those things that really make you who you are. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you had to acknowledge while working with your your wife, while, oh, by the way, she was pregnant. Congratulations. Uh, your son, right? Was, yep, was Judah. Born? Yep. Judah was born. So congratulations on that. That's a whole nother story, which we may touch on. Yep. Um, you had to have a heart to heart. Because again, she lived the last four years of up and to the right, husband's home at five or four or whatever it is, doesn't do anything on the weekend. And in order for you to get through, you know, 12 or 18 months, you, you had to change. You had you had to operate differently to so get through it. You're going to buy your first rental yep. property this 100%. year. 100%. I don't know what just happened there. Um, <laughs> no, 100%. So yeah, you know, and it's not even the last four years. It's been like the last 10 years together in marriage. You know, I, I have been... Um, you know, the way I said, I've always done it, you know, and she'll, yeah. she'll be the first to testify that. And, you know, at the end of the day, this last year was very difficult. Um, and I had to work more than I ever have. I've had to 
home or I've had to like uh, put out more fires than ever. I've had to fire, hire, you know, do so many different things, um, shut down businesses, uh, sell businesses, sell properties, um, just, you know, all these things you don't really have to do, you know, when you're in the accumulation stage. Right. Um, so, you know, you go to like your first defensive year um, in a long time. And, you know, what she didn't understand, because I just wasn't um, communicating properly was that, hey, um, I'm not working more because I'm like over here trying to like be ambitious and grow, right. and, like take us to the moon. I'm over here because I'm trying to make sure we don't collapse, you right. know? And so for me, um, I just knew I'm like, look, you know, we got like a hundred employees. Um, yeah. I have to, I owe it to not only them or my family, but I owe it to them and everyone else to just give it everything I've got to make sure that everything's going to be all good. Um, and I've always said this because it's like, look, at the end of the day, even if things did collapse, I know I'll be good the next day because right. I'll rebuild faster than, you know, ever. I you right. can't take away skills. You can't take away relationships. You can't take away faith. Like I, I know I'll be fine, but you know, at the end of the day, I just had to bear down. And, you know, she was um, having a really tough time because I didn't explain that to her. And all she sees me do is working more and more and more. And she sees it as a sign of, man, this guy is going against the things he says are important um, because he wants to just build this massive company. And, you know, it wasn't until we finally had a uh, real sit down because we were starting to have some problems. And I was like, look, this is what's happening. I don't tell you every little thing with business. It's always been that way our whole marriage. Um, she doesn't care to know. Um, she doesn't ask me like when I get home from work, like, Hey, what'd you do today? Because literally every hour I couldn't even repeat what I did. I'm like, um, I don't know. My brain is like, dead. I don't know. I, I can't even tell you what I just did for nine hours straight. Um, you know, cause most people, they have like one thing that happened that day and they're like, Oh yeah, right. this was pretty cool. I'm like, dude, every hour is on the hour with something. So you know, I explained it to her and I was like, look, this isn't about uh, me trying to grow. Like, this is the situation we're in. We're facing losses. We're facing lawsuits. We're facing this. We're facing that. Um, and unfortunately, I have to not only stop these fires, but I also have to make sure the business still operate and do the things we got to do as if they weren't happening, you know? Right. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot. Yeah. I think, again, I, I think communicate communication, especially as if a season changes with the significant other, in this case, your wife, um, I, you know, that will clearly be different going forward. You'll, you'll make sure to communicate more uh, if seasons change, because uh, that's what catches, you know, spouses and significant others by surprise. Right. They don't really understand that suddenly there's five fires. Right. They just, hey, yesterday was this. Today's different. Is that fair? Yeah. Well, yeah. And once again, right, it just depends like how much you and your spouse communicate, um, sure. you know, in terms of business. Mindy and I, like I said, we have not communicated about business very much for our entire marriage. Um, and I think that's actually been really good for us because one, she's really just not that interested. Like she's like, I like the life we live. I know you love doing it. And um, I'm not trying to mess it up. Just do you. <laughs> and you so, do you. Yeah. And so yeah. it's worked out great. And I'll tell her, you know, when I'm going to start something completely new and she's like, great, sounds good. Um, but, you know, we didn't communicate about this and uh, that's on me. You know, I take full responsibility for not telling her that, uh, yo, this is uh, this is what's actually happening. I, I'm not trying to grow the business. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like it. Well, another thing you talked about, as I remember correctly, is you had to make some hard calls on team members. And again, knowing you calling them team members is probably oversimplifying. They're probably more like family to you. Yeah. They, they had been with you a while. Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, something changed and they weren't, you know, weren't pairing their water and you had to make some tough calls. Yeah. You know, one thing I've come to realize in business is that, you know, nothing lasts forever. You know, at the end of the day, we'd love to build the next Coca-Cola but there are very few hundred year old companies. In fact, there are very few five year old companies. Eight, four out of five fail. There are very few 10 year old companies. I think the stat is nine out of 10 fail. And so, you know, you start thinking about that. And then you look at um, the way the world is today. 
Um, it's not like when we grew up where they're like, yeah, you know, you're going to go get in with a company early on, work your way up. You'll spend 20 years there. That's not what it is. You know, the average um, tenure in America is under three years at a job. So I've seen it firsthand where I'm like, you know, you get into business, you're like, dude, we're going to be like doing this forever. And then something happens. And there's a lot of things that can happen to cause it, right? I mean, one could be, okay, maybe you as a business owner, you just don't do a good job and the business fails, right? That hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, one could be the business outgrows that person. That's definitely like something I'm having to deal with is like, man, okay, well, we're going to grow, right? And we're going to keep going places. So if you cannot grow with it, well, I'm going to have to get somebody else who can. And so that's a tough thing. Um, and it doesn't mean they have to necessarily like lose their job, but they may get demoted or, you know, be stuck. They're not going to be able to keep progressing because they're just not good enough. And right. so that's, um, that, that could cause culture problems, you know, because people start to feel like, well, dude, I helped this company get to this point. You know, I've been here from the beginning and now you're going to bring in somebody else. And it's like, well, you know, I, I now understand why these publicly traded companies and these VCs and stuff like replace founders mm -hmm. because it, it, it's so clear to me now that like, yeah, you might've had a good idea. You might've been the guy for this current stage, but you are not the guy to get us to the next level. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you could lose them that way. Um, they could just have something happen in their life. They might go through a divorce. They might, mm -hmm. you know, get a drug problem. Like, you know, people yeah. are people. So, you know, at the end of the day, I've, I, I've realized nothing is forever and okay. you just have to like know that. Yeah. When you go back to that WealthCon presentation, sharing with those thousand folks, what are some of the other kind of highlights that you remember kind of that were important to you to kind of acknowledge, you know, this, this evolution? Um, you know, I talked about the communication piece. I talked about, um, how tough it was you know, letting people go, you know, on the real estate side, I talked about how, you know, many flippers were, you know, the reason they don't talk about it is because they're still like, they, they're starting over, like they're, they're done. And yeah. so, you know, these are guys who were millionaires who are now done and they've got to start back from zero. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm only able to talk about it. Cause that ain't me. I'm still up. Done. I don't need anyone to feel bad for me. I'm doing yeah. just fine. Yeah, but, yeah. uh, that's why I, could, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't be talking about it if I was starting from zero and I was like at, you know, yeah, the absolute bottom. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of it. But the, the main thing I said with how I got through so many losses was that I'm grateful. I have multiple cash conversion cycles for real estate. So exactly. lots of people are simply, you know, flippers only. And so they got to wait. You know, they, they were thinking they were going to wait three to six months to flip the house and get the money back and everything else. And then that turned into six to 12 months. And so, you know, all of a sudden money's not coming in and, and guess what? Six to 12 months later, instead of actually getting a check back, you're writing a check, writing a check. Yeah. That's what happened. And, yeah. you know, how do you write checks if you were expecting to make money? Well, you better be making money some other way. And so for me, um, one of the things that helped was obviously I have multiple businesses, so that helps, but even just on the real estate side, um, you know, knowing that, Hey, we still wholesale and do innovations. Like we have money coming in every month from yeah. deals that are just brand new. Um, I have a big rental portfolio. And so what did I do? Well, I sold off, you know, a few rentals. I probably sold off, um, I don't know, a million dollars of equity, you know, to tap into, to help sure. cover the loss. And it's like, you know, people are like, dude, I'm going to keep this rental forever. No, you're not. Yeah. Like, what's the point of a rental? It's just, it's an asset. And so yeah. why do you even have an asset? I mean, it's, it's, it's to make money. And mm -hmm. you know, for me, those are like little piggy banks I've got all over the country. And I'm like, Hey, I need the piggy bank right now. Let's sell that thing <laughs> and, yeah. you know, cover this loss. So, you know, I had rental properties and, you know, it's only because of, all these different cycles of how we make money in real estate that I was able to get through it. Yeah. I love that. Well, let's, let's talk about, you know, Ryan Pineda, the brand, you know, everything, if you were to kind of lay out all the income streams or businesses, would it be fair to say as a complete outsider 
that Ryan Pineda heading into 2024 versus coming into 2023 is less complex? Yes. More streamlined? Would that be fair? Absolutely. Yep. Way less going on. Yeah. And, and that was purposeful. Well, I mean, it is purposeful now after going through this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Definitely. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think acknowledging that, because I think, I th again, anytime you run a 10 year track record of everything's up and to the right, everything you touch is, is turns to gold. You can get a little fat, a little kind of stretched. Yep. And, you know, you have that one hard season where you're going back to the piggy banks. It's like, Hey, you know, there are seasons in this and uh, let's, let's, Let's do what we do really, really well. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you're set up for that. Is that fair? Oh, 1000%, man. You know, I've started a lot of different businesses over the last, um, call it four years. And, you know, I've had success in a bunch. I have had not success, the opposite of success in others. Um, I have sold businesses that have made profit and, you know, were successful and, it just wasn't worth it anymore. Or there was, you know, something that maybe not want to really, you know, see myself doing that the next five years or whatever. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think my life is so much more streamlined these days. You know, it's like, I really have, you know, three core pillars of what I'm doing at this point. Um, right. You know, one's obviously real estate and, you know, I'm going back to, actually my house flipping wholesaling company for the first time in years. And I'm reinventing that business. And, you know, this is like the biggest reinvention I've ever done in literally my career for, for that business. I mean, um, it's been pretty much the same business the last eight years and it's been very hands-off and now it's being reinvented to something that can be, you know, very massive. So I'm excited about that. Um, you know, then we, obviously we have the education piece and, you know, I have multiple businesses in the education world, but, you know, the cool thing about that is they all follow the same model. You know, you gotta be really good at, you know, teaching the subject at whatever it is you're doing. Right. And so we have education for real estate. We have education for social media. We have education for business. Um, and so we have great, you know, programs, and then we're really good at, you know, building funnels and sales and marketing to get people, you know, in the program. We're good at throwing events. And so, you know, obviously the education side, I love it because um, we help a lot of people, makes a lot of money, and it leads to a lot of opportunities with investments and deals and all of that. So, you know, that's the second pillar of what we do. And then, you know, the third pillar of what we do is just what I would say is the, the social media front, mm -hmm. you know? So, the social media side of things is just all about, you know, content and media and building everything on that front. And, um, you know, we're always trying to get better at that. You know, I'm, I'm building, um, you know, my employees up underneath me to be their own brands and own faces and playing the long game with that. And, you know, it's exciting. Yeah. I think one of the things that is, it should be known by folks if they don't, I'll put it out there is, these three pillars, they all cross pollinate, right? When people have pillars, they may think they're individual, but the way you're doing it and the way it is working, they all feed on each other. There's all cross pollination. Somebody comes in one, they could be part of the other. And that is really where you get maximum leverage. It's it's really well done. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, I have lots of things I want to do you know, still that are uh, not necessarily cross pollinating. Well, I guess social media cross pollinates everything, but um, you know, with the education, the real estate and everything um, not as much, but it's uh, I have the discipline this year to say that, no, you know, at least in, as of 2024, we're really right. going to just optimize and just do these things super well. And you know, does it mean I'm never going to start another business? Absolutely not. I love <laughs> entrepreneurship and uh, I love yeah. starting businesses and I know I will again too, but it's like, hey, this year's about- Not 2024. Know, not 2024. So let me go. I told you this in the intro that I was going to spring this on you. I believe this is your superpower. Um, it also might be part of what caused the pain in, in, you know, the last 12 or 18 months, but I think your superpower watching from the outside and knowing you, you know, a millimeter deep is delegation. Mm. And you could take an idea, you could take the inspiration, but you are very comfortable 
my my words, not yours, giving it to someone else, right? You hire that next level and you trust them to do their thing. And um, that's what I, that that's a superpower, I think. And certainly one I do not have. <laughs> what do you think of that? Um, no, I love it. Yeah, a lot of people have told me that. Um, I was on my friend Omar El Takori's podcast recently and he was like, can I tell you what I think your superpower is that you don't even know? And I was like, are you going to say delegating or what? Oh, okay. Hey, a lot everybody of people, All right. A lot of people say that. And um, I guess a lot of people struggle with it. You know, that yeah. it, for me, it was always a natural thing just because I wanted to uh, play baseball and also make money and I couldn't do uh, both. And so I learned at a very young age in my entrepreneur career of like, well, I guess I got to just like hire people if I want to do both. And so I never was like, well, it's only one thing or the other. It's like, no, it. like there's a way to do it all. I just need more people. Like it was obvious to me. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do think I agree with you on that. Um, but Omar kind of even framed it in an even deeper way. He's like, you know, I think what you are is a productivity expert. Ooh. And I was like, okay, that's an interesting thing because delegation fits, you know, underneath that, but yeah. you know, that now starts to cover the other aspects that, I've been talking about with wealthy way and everything with, Hey, time management, you know, yeah. doing the most valuable things, focusing on the things that are going to make the most impact and create the most revenue, um, identifying the priorities and how you're going to, you know, reach that. That's all in the realm of productivity. And I was like, man, maybe I'm not like a business guy. Maybe I'm a self-help guy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe actually, I think Omar is onto something. I think that is a, a better framing. Because I don't yeah. think it's delegation to just like, hey, it's your responsibility. I'm going to hold you accountable. It is about being productive and 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 doing. I I could see that. I think Omar Omar is onto something. So shout out Omar. Nah. Um, let's let's switch let's switch it up a little bit. Um, you put on an event, I believe, every quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had the biggest of big names out there. Um, why don't we talk about how did how did WealthCon start? Like, where was that idea? When did it start? When did it become quarterly? And uh, man, it's a thousand people strong now. So let's let's just talk about the event. Yeah. So first off, um, it didn't start out as WealthCon. What it started out as is, you know, back in 2020, right before COVID, I started my coaching program and. With the coaching program, there wasn't even a plan to meet. It was like, yeah, it's all virtual. Let's do our thing. And at the time, there was 10 people. And, you know, we're doing these calls for a couple of months. And I was like, hey, you know what? I think we should all meet in person and get to know each other and, you know, like really set some goals for the quarter because it was coming up um, in March. Right. And I was right. like, how would you guys like to come to Vegas? We'll come to my house. We'll do it in my living room. We'll hang out have dinner and all of that. And they were like, <laughs> let's do it. So um, I think eight out of the 10 were able to make it. We had people from Hawaii, Alaska, um, you know, the Midwest, wow. everywhere. And, you know, it was just super cool. And what's really cool is like out of those um, people that were there that day, I think 80, 90% of them are still in the program for wow. years. Really good friends. Um but anyways, it started as that. And I tell that story a lot because there was no vision of, dude, every quarter, not even when I started the program, were we supposed to meet every quarter? It just like occurred to me that, hey, we should probably meet up in person. I think it's important. Well, as we know, COVID hit and, uh, you know, we, you know, went in lockdown and everything else. And then, you know, when things opened back up, I was like, hey, let's meet up again. You know, people are able to come out. Let's go. And so we met up again. Um, like at the end of June and that ended up being, you know, our second meeting. And I was like, all right, you know, how was the quarter? Everyone's doing good. You know, the program's bigger now. This is great. And then um, at that point I had this, this office that I'm in today. And so we met in the conference room, not my house. And then, um, you know, the next quarter, it just became like expected because at that point mm -hmm. they were like, well, yeah, we meet every quarter. That's what we do. And I'm like, <laughs> that's what, that we is what we do. You know? so, <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we, the, the next quarter we meet in the office again and people are loving it, but this time the, the program's getting bigger. And I'm like, I don't think the office can hold this anymore. And right. so, um, the, the next one coming up, 
I was like, I'm gonna have to like actually get a venue. And so, you know, I ended up uh, getting this venue downtown that was free, that could hold like a um, hundred people. And I was like, all right, it's gonna be great. So, you know, we get this venue and, you know, we do this great mastermind. There's no speakers, like the, the whole time, it's just like a pure mastermind. It's me, it's, yeah. it's the students presenting, it's everything. And, um, you know, after we do it downtown, I'm like, you guys want to go out for drinks? And they're like, yeah, because we're just downtown. And so we go out to the bar down the street and like everybody has a blast. And I'm like, oh. all right, that was cool. So then the next one, we do it at that same place, but this time we plan it. We're like, yeah, okay. So we're going to do this downtown thing. It's going to be sick. And then, you know, I rent out this, this bar. People are like, dude, that this is awesome. <laughs> so then the program gets bigger. It just keeps growing. And, right. um, by the way, I don't sell, I never advertise or sell tickets to this. It's strictly for the students. Right. And, um, at this point that, that location will no longer fit us and I'm going to have to go get a hotel. And so I started right. looking at prices of hotels and I'm like, dang, the strip is expensive. Expensive. I tried that too. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. And so uh, we finally get this uh, quote from a hotel downtown called the D and it's like 50 grand for you know, a couple of days. It doesn't ever even make sense to do it for just one. You right. know, you have to do it for two. And I'm like, well, I, if I'm going to do a two-day event, it's going to cost me 50 Gs. Um, I might as well, like, sell some tickets to it. Try to, like, sure. cover my cost, at least. And then people can, you know, meet the uh, the students and maybe they'll join and whatever. There was, like, no pitches or anything. And um, so we do this first one at the D. There's, like, 200 people or something. And... It's great. And it's the first time I ever got speakers. I had my buddy Steve Trang come. Mm -hmm. I had my buddy um, Chandler David Smith come. My buddy Kong came. Yeah. There's like yeah. three speakers. And right. it was great. People loved it. It was a two-day event. There was a lot of teaching. The students still were presenting at that time. I think they had like six student presentations that were really good. And then, um, you know, we would we would go downtown and party. So, you know, we did that for a couple of times. Then we outgrew the D. So we go to the Sahara and the Sahara oh, yeah. can fit like, um, it's still like close to downtown, but sure. we're making our way up the strip towards, right. you know, um, having made it. Okay. So we're, um, we're on the Sahara. We're almost there. And I think the Sahara could fit like 300 to 350 or something. And so, you know, we end up doing a couple of events there and, you know, I'm getting better and better speakers too. You know, Brad Lee comes and my buddy Carlos Reyes and, um, you know, people are loving it. Then finally we do that twice. So like, it's basically I had this pattern of, I do two at a venue and then, you know, we, we, we level up to the next venue. That was like the pattern. Okay. So then, um, we're going into this, this next one. And I'm like, dude, guys, we were going to have to actually go on the strip and we're going to have to pay big bucks. We need to like do this. Yeah. I was like, who are we going to get? And um, I had text my buddy Hormozy. And at this point, Hormozy, you know, people obviously knew who he was, but he wasn't as big as he is today. And I was like, Hey, you know, I'd love for you to speak at the event. Um, we're going to get the Mandalay Bay and it's going to be epic. And, you know, him and Layla are like, yeah, we'll do it. I'm like, awesome. They didn't charge anything. Um, they're like, how long do you want us to speak? I was like, literally, you guys could speak as long as you want. They ended up speaking about three hours. And mm -hmm. uh, we did, Layla did an amazing presentation for like an hour. Alex did one for an hour. And then I interviewed both of them um, on stage. And, you know, that event, we we had about 700 or something. And it was epic. It was just like, it was a whole different level. It was like, wow, mm -hmm. these events are now becoming like, next yeah, a thing yeah, yeah 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 and at the time it was still a real estate only event it was just still it was called future flipper mastermind that was what it was still called even though it was like an event i'm like i don't even know how this happened it literally happened in just like yeah. two years um yeah. so then going into 2023 we're like okay well i mean now the bar is pretty high we're gonna have to do this and you know as i went into the year i was like okay you know, I'm starting to be known for the wealthy way. And I think we're going to have to rebrand our companies around yeah. wealth. And so I rebrand all the businesses, you know, right. and, you know, Future Flipper becomes wealthy investor. And, you know, we create all these other wealthy businesses and, um, mm -hmm. you know, create this idea of wealth con. Um, but, you know, in January, 
I hold, um, you know, what, what was called the Tyke Summit, which was the first ever real estate and crypto event because I had my NFT project Tykes, which was ultra successful. And I was like, look, I want to hold the biggest ever real estate and crypto event in the world. Okay. And we ended up doing that. There was over a thousand people. The event was sick. You know, mm -hmm. it was two days. People loved it. Then, you know, going to the next one, we're like, what would happen if we held one out of state? We've never done it out of state. Let's try it out. And so the first ever wealth con, I was like, what am I going to call this event? Because it's not going to be the NFT event. So, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not the future Flipper mastermind anymore. What's going to be the name? And I was just like, I don't know. Wealth con sounds pretty tight. And so it, it was literally Great like, there, there wasn't a lot of thought put into it. It was like, all right, wealth con's a good name. Let's roll with that. So then, you know, we do it in Hollywood. Once again, over a thousand people. Um, it was great, but I'll say it was much harder on us to go out of state and bring the staff and yeah. just, it, it was just harder. And um, there was a lot of things in, in Hollywood that made it even more difficult for the people. Like they couldn't handle lunch and stuff mm -hmm. because they're just not used to that many people in you know, just this one area. So um, we ended up going back to Vegas in uh, July and we, we did the Mirage and that was our biggest one ever. I think we had like 1300 and looking back at it, I, I now realize I was like, dang, dude, that one was stacked. Like, I didn't think about it at the time. Cause I was just asking my buddies, like literally the way that I fill the wealth con lineup is I look at like who was on my podcast recently and I'm like, okay, yep. I, he, he hasn't been on stage. At, like before with me or like in over a year or something because mm -hmm. i don't want the same like that's what's crazy about it is it you're just yeah. getting a new variety every event yeah. and um dude that one we had brandon turner um you know bradley andy elliott dan martell um i don't even remember but it was like a crazy lineup and i was like wow dude how did i <laughs> that was how did i pull that off <laughs> i was like that was a lot of bangers i don't know that i could uh you know, like re redo that level of, of like speaking talent again. But, uh, you know, then we ended up doing the next one um, at the M Casino, which was like, I'd literally made my way. The M is, for those who don't know, in all the way South Las Vegas, yeah, as far South as it gets. And it's super sick, super nice. It's just not on the strip. So we had worked our way literally from downtown Vegas, which is all the way up North to the end of the strip. And it was like, wow. We like literally just, we did. <laughs> and, um, you know, the M was great. We had Ed Milet and uh, yeah, a bunch of other people. That. And, um, you know, we're back at the M for this January, which, you know, we got Tim Tebow and yeah. Thatch Nguyen. And, you know, so the speakers are still great. And um, I'm actually yeah. right now um, in the process of planning out April's because it's just, you're always planning for the next one. Yeah. Yeah, if somebody wanted to go to it, I love Thatch Nguyen, Tim Tebow, and other speakers. Where would they go to get their tickets? Because I know it'll sell out. Where would we send them? Wealthcon.org. Wealthcon.org. Go check it out, folks. Um, I love all of that. I, I think we talked about on your podcast, I'm hosting my first event ever because we hit 50,000 subs. You're right. Vegas is crazy expensive. Everything seems to cost from venue to video to food to just all these other extras. Um, so it was fun hearing your story, how, how you went from a, a free space all the way up to the Mirage and ultimately out of the M. So, um, yeah, I think these, it is not cheap to hold an event in Vegas. That's for sure. Wow. So you already held yours, right? Or are you still going to no, hold February 17th and 18th president's <laughs> day weekend? Yep. All hmm. sold out. We sold out VIP and general admission. Um, but yeah, 300 people. We're doing our first event with 300 people. Nice. Where's it going to be at in Vegas? Uh, it's at the blind center. So off the strip, uh, it's, it's a the blind center obviously serves the visually impaired of Clark County. They do a genius idea is they rent their space out on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm. Um, and I rented the entire space, even though I didn't need it. So I could give back because uh, it's obviously helps them fund the business. And yeah. uh, we're putting on a concert. There's, they have their own house band called the uh, blind or the broken spectacles. Cause it's a blind or sight impaired singing. So, I'm buying everything they have uh, to support the blind center. And uh, oh, yeah, it should, I love should it. be a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things I do want to talk about is again, I'm an outsider. I watch what you're doing. 
Uh, it seems to me you started something in 2023 that you're passionate about, didn't talk about a lot, but I think it's going to be a big part of your future. And that is something I've heard you call wealthy kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? What, where is it at? And, and what do you, what, where's it going? Yeah. So, you know, wealthy kingdom is, um, you know, like, like I said, one of our education arms, um, but, you know, we're in the process of becoming a nonprofit. So hopefully, fingers crossed, it all gets approved. I don't know how long it's going to take. We've submitted months and no months. Idea. <laughs> but uh, yeah, essentially, it is a place for Christian entrepreneurs. Um, you know, essentially how it started was I've been in Bible study with other business people for the last six years. Um, and I've held it, you know, in my offices and at my house and, you know, all these other things literally every week for six mm -hmm. years straight. And I would post about it on my Instagram. And I'd be like, Hey, you know, Bible study. And, you know, people started to ask me, dude, how can I attend it? You know? And if they were in Vegas, I'd let people attend. And if they were out of state, they're like, can I zoom in? Um, and I'm like, no, there's like, you know, very private things people are sharing. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, where, where can I find something like this where I'm at? And I was like, honestly, it just doesn't really exist. Um, your church might have something, but odds are it just doesn't really exist. Hmm. They're like, dang, dude. Well, let me know if you open one up and wherever. Right. And so finally last December at this time, December is the only month, um, you know, we take off and, you know, we just kind of do it to plan for the coming year and rest and everything else. And, mm -hmm. um, I met with, you know, the people who have been attending it for years are top like leaders. And I was like, guys, so what do we want to do this year? You know, do we want to, you know, we're just thinking from the Vegas perspective. We're like, Hey, sure. do we want to like go on some trips together? Do we want to like, what studies do we want to do? How do we want to do it? And, um, they were like, well, yeah, we need to do X. We can do Z, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then like, it just occurred to me as we were talking, I was like, man, we just need to go big. And they're mm -hmm. like, what do you mean? And I was like, we need to go nationwide. This isn't about us anymore. Ooh. Like, we need to quit thinking about this from just our perspective because it's going to be super easy for us to like create this curriculum and then give it to leaders all across the country. We already have massive, you know, community of students in all these different programs. And they tell me they want to do it, they just don't know how. Well, right. we have the curriculum and we're attracting the people in those cities and we're funneling them into these groups. And we already know we have reliable leaders because these people have been in my programs for years. We're already like ready. It's just a matter of saying yes. And so it became clear at that point. I was like, you know what? We're going to do it. And um, it didn't have a name or anything. I was like, but we're just going to launch these Bible studies and I'm going to figure out what else I want to do, how it's going to, um, you know, sustain itself what's it going to look like? How much will it cost? And all that. How are we going to train leaders? How are we going to hold them accountable? Who's going to be the head pastor? All this stuff. So I figured all that out, you know, in the coming months. Um, and, you know, I got prepped to launch. We started to train up leaders to be able to launch their, their Bible studies. And um, I think it was like in June that we, we officially launched and man, uh, this year we started 50 Bible studies nationwide. Wow. And, we went on mission trip to Mexico. We um, did some other cool things as a group. Uh, we had weekly calls together virtually as a group. And it was amazing. Um, on top of that, we started incorporating it into WealthCon as well. You know, this year uh, with WealthCon, I started to do something. And, you know, I just, it, it was all part of the same thing. God just called me to be more bold just on social media and events and in my business and everything else. And, um, I was like, hey, if anyone wants to pray, you know, we're going to just pray in the morning on the, the last day of the event. And I was like, it's going to be early because the event starts at nine. So come at 730. We're going to go into the little breakout room. And if you show up, we'll pray and let's do this. And, you know, I don't know if people are going to show up. I'm like, maybe like, I don't know, 50 people show up or something. It's early. People like are out late the night before. It's Vegas, baby. Yeah. yeah I'm like, I don't know how many are going to do this. Kid you not, 300 people showed up at 7.30 in the morning. And I was like, dude, all right, well. We go to the big room. <laughs> well, I was like, the, the room could fit 300. It was packed. But I was yeah. like, well, 
now I have to like give a sermon. This isn't just like me thinking yeah. I'm just going to pray anymore. I'm going to yeah. have to give a sermon and talk to everyone and then pray. And so like out of nowhere, yeah. you know, I start giving a sermon and um, sharing what was on my heart. And I actually at that, that one too, we had not launched Wealthy Kingdom yet, but I was like, hey, this is what we're about to do. This yeah. is what we need to pray for. And for anyone here who wants to lead a group, raise your hand. And so that's exactly what we did. And, um, you know, it, it was crazy. So, you know, it's funny because it kind of happened the same way that um, the original WealthCon happened of just, I was right. like, oh, that was weird. I can't believe it was like that. So the next one, I was like, hey, we're going to do it again, 730. Well, again, like 300, 400 people show up and somebody's like, dude, we should do like we should get like a guitar and stuff and do some worship music and and like have a a, a true service you know mm -hmm. we'll do some singing we'll have a sermon we'll pray and like let's do a a legit service and i was like guys you know what we're not going to just get a guitar if we're going to have a legit service we're going to have a legit service we're going to just mm -hmm. make it part of the event it'll be on the main stage and i'm going to get the best of the best and so they were like let's do it so this last wealth con, um, it was just part of the event. And I had my buddy Jordan Feliz, who's like a world renowned Christian singer, um, come lead. And my wife put together a band. We had like eight people, mm. like full on rock concert. Nice. Um, and, and then I got my buddy Tim Ross to give a sermon. He, he has the biggest Christian podcast in the world. And um, it was crazy. And that was like the highlight of the event. Uh, and I told everyone it was optional. Like I was like, Hey guys, just so you know, like this is going to be, you know, on the last day at the beginning, if you, you don't have to attend, you know, it, the, the normal stuff will start back at 10 30, but if you want to come at nine, this is what we're going to do. Cool. Well, everyone came and it was nuts. It was easily the highlight of the event. And so now it's just a part of WealthCon. Like these things just mm -hmm. becoming, just keep becoming part of it. Yeah. I mean, all those stories I hear from you, you get an idea, you see a need, you lean and you just keep going forward uh, and you keep executing, you keep learning, you keep improving. So it makes total sense that they're kind of cross pollinating and, and tying together. We're right near the end of this, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you about what is, what's got Ryan fired up about 2024. 2024 seems to be a very different market leaving 2022 into 23. 24 appears to at least today to be different. Uh, what's got you excited? I'll tell you, um, looking at it, I've never been more excited for a year than I am for this coming year. Wow. And, really? You've been doing yeah. this a decade or so and you're okay. All right. Tell me why I like it. Well, I'll tell you, it's like, there's only been a couple times in my life where I felt like I had, um, crystal clear clarity okay. and like I had something new that I just mm -hmm. knew was going to crush. And you know, I'll tell you like, so in 2015, when I learned about flipping house, like, so I learned about hard money loans and stuff at the end of 2014. And I knew going into 2015, I was like, I'm about to crush. Like, mm -hmm. this is what I've been searching for. There was no proof that it was going to work or anything, but I just knew. Yeah. And then that was the start of what everything became. Mm -hmm. In 2020, you know, I get this idea about social media and everything else. And like 2019, I'd already been thinking about it and like kind of prepping and researching and then COVID just really like amplified it. Yep. But I just knew I was like, dude, I am doing social media and I'm going to crush. I don't know how long it will take. I don't know where it's going to lead, but I just know that this is what I'm supposed to do. Okay. So, you know, it crushes. This year in 2024, is the first time again in four years, literally, you know, like if anyone would ask me at the beginning of 2023, like, Hey, how's this year going to be? I mean, you could look back to other interviews and stuff. I was like, Hey, it's going to be a rough year guys. Like this is yeah. and I told my team that I'm like, dude, I already know we're sitting on a bunch of losses. I'm going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with it. Um, the market's going to suck you guys. And I literally told my team, I go, you're going to have to work four times as hard to make the same amount of money yeah. that you're accustomed to. You're Just right. So and so I'm very realistic. I don't just say this lightly, but yeah, this year in 2024, I feel like I have so much more clarity and 
like revelation on the next big thing. And, you know, for me, that next big thing is just getting really good and not actually, I take that back, not getting really good, but being the best mm. at digital marketing. And the reason I'm excited for that is because the last bunch of years, I've just hired media buyers and all these guys and just kind of delegated and let them do their thing. And, you know, it's at varying degrees of success. And it finally hit a tipping point where I was like, you know what, I'm going to just research this myself. You know, I've been in the game long enough. I've spent millions of dollars with these guys. I might as well start looking at what's actually happening and what they're doing and how they do it and see where they're screwing up. Because that's what I've always done in my career, whether it's flipping houses, social media, I've always looked at what the best people did. And I've been easy, well, not easy, but I've been able to identify the weaknesses and the ways that could be improved and how I would do it. Got it. And with this, it's like, holy crap. There's a lot of talkers out there who will tell you they'll just do everything. Yeah. And to me now, having just tired so many people and seen how they run things behind the scenes. I'm like, dude, number one, I know how to run this better. And number two, it's like what I had when I was doing social media in 2020, where I saw the competition. I'm like, so you're telling me that guy's the biggest guy. Mm -hmm. That one, that guy right there. Okay. I yeah. got it. I'm like, that's the guy that you're saying. That's the biggest guy. And what does he do? That's yeah. Uh, well, did All right. This is not going to be hard. I've done yeah, things let's go. way harder yeah. in my life than this. So, yeah. you know, that's what I've been de devoting the last, uh, let's just say three, four months to, and I've already taken over all of my, um, media buying and digital marketing like all in house. I've already built a team. I've rebuilt new CRMs and funnels and flows. Nice. Um, and I know it's so important because everything we do in business is marketing and sales. And so mm -hmm. for me, you know, the number one way to market right now is digitally. And so how good are you at creating ads and Facebook and, you know, YouTube and all these different things. And, um, at this point, yeah, you know, I know how to run that stuff. And, you know, we're just continuing to get better for like the education products. But the part I'm most excited about, and people don't know this, is how that's going to impact my real estate business. People yes. have no idea how massive this is going to be because all these real estate investors have no idea about any of the things I know yeah. about digital marketing for like online products. Um, it's just not used because it's just like a totally different skill set that online marketers and these guys have been doing for a long time. I'm going to take that I like to it. the real estate investing side. And so for me, um, you know, one of the big changes and shifts we're making, like I said, we're, we're going to go through the biggest shift we've ever gone through in my real estate business, um, mm -hmm. is we're going nationwide and we're going to be wholesaling nationwide. And I get kind of like... <laughs> Uh, I start just laughing, thinking about the numbers because it doesn't seem like it can be true, hmm. but it is. And I just, you know, it's just a matter of doing it, but hmm. like, you know, right now in, in Vegas, we've run TV commercials for four years straight and that was a big risk. And obviously it's paid off. It cost me $600 to get a lead in Las Vegas on a TV okay. commercial. That's the cost. Hmm. And it's highly competitive. You have to be really good at sales Mm -hmm. to get the deal, even with that high quality of a lead. Dude, I can get leads all over the country in less competitive markets where the sale is freaking easy for 20 bucks. Oh, wow. And you start thinking about this and you're like, holy crap. Like I'm about That's to take everyone's cookies because I know how to create these ads and funnels and generate all these leads. And my team now has the capability to actually wholesale nationwide and be able to capitalize on them. And so like the opportunity is so massive on the real estate side, just in that front, but also being able to use the skills to raise capital and run funnels and ads for raising capital, which I've never had done before. And, mm -hmm. you know, different things like IRAs and everything else that are such easy ways to raise capital that, you know, it's just like my mind, it felt like <laughs> it, reached, it opened up a new thing that, yeah. I'm just like, holy crap. It, like I said, I've only had this happen a few times where I'm like, right. hard money. Duh. That's 
what I needed. Social media. Uh, okay, social media yeah. was a thing, but I now see the process. Like I can see how you have it succeed. Right. There's a right. clear template and blueprint to having success. And then this is the next iteration in my business career for me. That's awesome. Well, we're going to wrap it up right there. There's so much other things we could have talked about. If somebody wanted to follow your journey in this year that you're going to crush, where do we send them? Man, just Google me, Ryan Pineda. Um, whatever pops up, pops up. But yeah, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you'll find me. Um, you want to work with us, you can go to ryanpineda.com and you know we got just kind of all the stuff there. There you go. Ryan, you're amazing, man. Take care of yourself. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me.